Well, good morning, First Church. Let's stand together and lift our voices in worship this morning. Yours is the name high above any other. Yours is the kingdom forever you reign. And yours is the power that lifted us out of the grave. Yours is the heart that is beating inside us. Yours is the glory and all of the fame. And yours is the love that you poured down. Sing this out to the King Almighty, to the one who saves, be glory and honor for all our days. With our hands toward heaven and our voices raised, to the King Almighty, we give all our praise. Yours is the whole earth and everything in it. Yours are the stars that you spoke into place. And yours are the shouts of the sons and daughters. Lifting up your holy name. Sing this out. To the King Almighty, to the one who saves. Be glory and honor for all our days. With our head toward heaven and our voices raised. To the King Almighty, we give all our praise for unending mercy, for amazing grace, for life everlasting, for sin erased. With our hands on heaven and our voices raised, to the King Almighty, we give all our praise. Let the glory of the Lord 
with the praises of the King. Rise among us, let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Yes, I 
authority now we are joining to the praise of his glory his glory upon this rock we build your church and the gate outside the doors here. We can see the steps up to the sanctuary. We can walk in traditions and see 
the stained glass, we can see the cross, we can see the pipe organ. We can walk through the building and see your presence everywhere, Lord, and we come into this place and we can see a place where people gather to worship your name, Lord. We do give you thanks for building the physical structure of the church, Lord. But today we ask that you build us, Lord. For those of us who struggle in the room, Lord, we ask for you to build, build our trust. Build our trust so that we know that when we're going through a storm or we're struggling or something's happening in our personal lives that we can trust in you. We ask you, Lord, build that trust so that we can lean upon you. Lord, for those of us learning here in this environment, we ask you to build our faith. We're learning about from word, we're learning the Bible, we're learning from Amy, we're learning from Clinton. Lord, we ask you to help us learn and to build our faith. And Lord, for all of us who are learning and all of us who are struggling, we ask you to build our passion so that we can share what we've learned to trust, so that we can share what we have learned in faith. Lord, build our passion. Lord, today, thank you again for this place but we are now open. We're open to hear the word, and we are open to you building our trust, and building our faith, and building our passion to serve the one and only God. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, for all those kids who are in the house, I think we're going over this way, and while the kids are doing that, if you turn and say good morning to your neighbor. Well, good morning, friends. That is indeed the theme of where we have found ourselves as we have kicked off 2024 with this series that we are FUMCT. And friends, we are excited to be FUMCT. We are excited to see what God can do with us and our lives if maybe this year we just take one little step. Make one little extra commitment this year that we didn't make before to say, God, help my faith to grow this year in this way. Build your church within me in this way this year, I pray. And so, friends, that is what we invite you to do next week especially. Spend this week praying over that. Spend, spend this week praying over what a new commitment this year might look like for you so that next week as you gather here and we worship together, that we come with a place of expectancy and we come into a place of where we're saying, okay, God, I'm ready. I'm ready to make that commitment. So with that said, as I talk about next Sunday, I invite you to take out your phones, turn on the camera, fill out the form, let us know that you are here and you are worshiping with us. Let us know how we can help you make next steps in your faith or how I can pray with you throughout the week. Next week, though, as we gather here, we have shifted plans just a bit. An email went out yesterday to that effect. We will have a time of celebration, a time of commitment, a time of holy communion here as we worship together. And so instead of that 10 o'clock pep rally, we are meeting everyone where we already are. So that then, as we get out of worship, if you have any questions about a certain ministry area and you wanna to talk to someone, you don't have to go anywhere. You just have to go to that hall right there where someone is ready and waiting to answer those questions, to share more about mission or family ministries, whatever it might be about how you might be able to make a new commitment and get more involved. So next Sunday, after all four services, the two in here, we invite you to come out to this hallway if you have questions. And if you go to the sanctuary, you can head to the Great Hall for those questions as well. After you hit submit on that form, you'll be redirected to our giving page where we are reminded of the chance that we have, the opportunity that we have to offer to God all that we are, all that we have, our time, our talents, our gifts, our service, and our witness to the glory of God for the transformation of the world. And so we give thanks for the chance that we have to do that today and every day of our lives. So friends, our sermon theme, our theme for worship today is mission. 
And our bumper this morning is an interview with Wendy Kennedy. It was supposed to be Todd and Wendy, but Todd was sick, and so Wendy is on the video sharing about the eyeglass ministry and, and aspect of mission here at First Church. So before we even get started into that video, I have a question. Anyone know that we have an eyeglass ministry within mission? New, new to the majority, correct? And so here is a chance to learn more about one area of mission ministry here at First Church, and we'll get back to it later on. So let's hear from Wendy. Groups would go in um, on mission trips, and they would bring glasses that were donated from the church, and they would just try them on the patients to see if, if it would help. So this was developed, and they developed a um, some equipment that would read the eyes, and it would compute into um, into the computer and relay the reading of the eyes and then we were able to match them with eyeglasses. Um, the glasses that, that, that this church donates, we send off to Kendall Eye Ministries in Kentucky and they read the glasses and they send them back and so we, we know what strength they are. So we put this in our inventory, we use the equipment to read the patient's eyes and then we match it up with the, the, as close as we can get to for them to be able to see with these glasses. Um, this is something that um, my husband and I um, wanted to do together. Um, we had, you know, I wanted, we wanted to do missions. We didn't know what we could do. He's more of a builder and I'm, I'm a nurse. And so we thought, what can we do together? Um, instead of doing separate mission trips, we wanted to do them together. So the eyeglasses ministry opportunity came about and we um, were able to go to a training in Kentucky um, and learned how to use the equipment. Um, this is not necessarily what everyone has to do. There's several things that, that if you want to become involved with this eyeglass ministry, um, you can do it locally. We have the inventory here. Um, if you're computer savvy, you can look up um, on our inventory. And it, the, what's, what we're trying to do now with this ministry locally is have local doctors will read the patient's eyes and um, then they'll bring in their prescription and we'll look at our inventory and see what we have that will best suit this patient. So that's what we're doing locally. Um, if you're interested in coming on a mission trip but don't necessarily have the time to go and be trained on the equipment, um, Todd and I would love for anyone to come and help us. You don't have to be trained on the equipment. We'll you know, know how to do that and then you can help us fit the glasses and that that entails actually making sure they fit on their face, you know, different things like that, and, and showing the patient, you know, trying them on, and it's amazing um, when you have a patient that can't see the person that they came with or has never seen their face before. And they put the glasses. Sorry. And they put the glasses on, and I'm like, oh, I, you know, for the first time, it's it's amazing seeing these patients um, putting these glasses on. So it's very rewarding in that sense, and um, helping people also, even just with readers, if they're you know my age and they can't read and they want to read their Bible or a book then you can help them in that way as well. The patient couldn't find their, I think it was a brother that was in the crowd, couldn't find their brother and had the glasses on and was looking around and couldn't find him, took the glasses off and was like, oh, there he is. Because he'd never seen, it, it's crazy. Um, that was, that was the thing that was really wow. That, that moment was wow. You recognized him without the glasses, but when you put the glasses on and he could actually see him, you didn't recognize him. We would really appreciate anyone who wanted to be involved in any way. Um, 
either by getting trained on the equipment or by just coming and learning what we do and helping us get the eyeglasses on the patients or just looking in the inventory to see if, if there's a match for a local um, eyeglass patient. So um, any way you can help would be greatly appreciated and uh, we, we look forward to meeting you or seeing you soon. We will circle back around to that at the end of our time together, but first I have a question for us. All right, get ready. Deep question about mission is, what is the condition of your feet right now? So as you think about your feet right now, would you say, see, I already see the cringes. Thank you, Wade. Would you say that they are in like full-on winter hibernation mode? Are they like ready to be seen at any given moment? Are, are you a little timid to let your feet be shown at this point in time? What, what would you say is the condition of your feet? Okay, so I know that that's a really cringy question to ask to get started with. As my eight-year-old would say, he would either use the word cringy or he would be like, Hey, yo, man, that's sus, or something like that. Uh, it depends on the day and the reaction that he would like to get from me as to which of those two routes he will take in responding to that. But we don't like to talk about feet, right? It's really risky to begin a sermon by talking about feet and asking about the state of your feet because I can promise you that if I announced that we were going to have a foot washing service, there would be about... Ten, if I'm lucky, faithful of you that would say, okay, sign me up for that. Because there's just something about feet that like really creates that cringe within us. And guess what, friends? We're talking about feet this morning. Uh, so let's shift that question just a bit. What is it to you that makes feet beautiful? As you think about that to yourself, what is it about feet that makes them beautiful, or what is it about feet that makes them cringy? What is it about feet that makes, if you think of what it is that makes a foot look beautiful, what is that? See, in a world of pedicures and well-maintained feet, or if they're not, feet that are covered up like my great covered up shoes right now, our text this morning calls us to a different place of understanding of what it is that makes feet beautiful and what it is that makes feet ugly. But before we get there, we need to understand why Paul was writing about feet in the first place. So we're going to back up just a couple of verses before we get to the verses about feet. So you have a little moment about not talking about feet. You're welcome. So our first text this morning comes from Romans, the 10th chapter, verses 12 and 13. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is the Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. All. Every single person who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There is no amount of of works. There is nothing that we can do that can get us to that point. It is simply a thing where Paul says to us, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you notice that there are quotes in that last part of our text. Quotes because Paul is quoting a prophet of Israel. Paul is quoting Joel 2.32, where Joel says, one day it will be proclaimed that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. As Paul shares these words in this letter, he is sharing with an early church, a church that is still trying to figure out what it looks like to follow Jesus, what it looks like to be a part of the body of Christ, and specifically what it looks like to include people who have different backgrounds, who understand the world differently, who have different rituals, who maybe eat differently, who, who maybe look differently. What does it look like to have this community where people who grew up in a Jewish faith are now in the midst of people who did not, the Gentiles? It's the very topic of conversation in my and Pastor Clinton's Wednesday night study as we work through Galatians tackling that very topic as well together. And so here this early church is struggling, they're wrestling. What does it look like? Because we've been taught that we are here and these other people are less than and, and now we're supposed to try to see everybody as equal and, and there was a lot of struggle and tension within that and Paul is writing to them to say, you know what? Everyone is important. 
All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, regardless of what the world tells you, regardless of what you've been told, regardless of all of the ways that we have divided ourselves up. You are important, and if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. And that is the message that is worth shouting from the mountains. It is actually the message that changed John Wesley, the founder of Methodism's life. If we're talking about how important, how pivotal, how incredibly powerful this text is. We've talked about John Wesley and the Aldersgate Road experience and his heart being strangely warmed and his life being transformed. And it was through hearing these words that that happened. Do we understand the magnitude, the gravity behind this statement from Paul? For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is the Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is earth-shaking, world-changing, life-changing news. Which brings us to our second text. Raising the question of how will people know this message? How will people receive this life-changing news if there aren't messengers around to share it? So how can they call on someone they don't have faith in? And how can they have faith in someone they haven't heard of? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who announce the good news. For as it is written, how beautiful are the feet that announce the good news. Remember, the good news is what we just talked about a moment ago. As that text says, as it is written, we want to look at where is that written? Where did that come from? And for that, we go to Isaiah 52, 7, a message from the prophet envisioning a day when this will happen. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of a messenger. A messenger who proclaims peace, who brings good news, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God rules, or your God won. See, the role of a messenger at that point in time in Old Testament scripture, the understanding of what that person is and and what they're doing, a messenger was the person who would leave after a battle has ended and run as far as they had to run. I mean, I'm sure they had to walk at times or take breaks, but get all the way back to the kingdom to tell the watchman and the king the news of the battle. We see this in 2 Samuel play out with King David and the watchman waiting as that messenger comes running back up to them to share the news of the battle. So a messenger is someone who runs after this battle has been won and comes and shares that news with the people, or with all the kingdom saying, hey, here's the news. But this time, the prophet is talking about a different kind of news being shared by a messenger. The ultimate news that God has won the battle, that God has won something bigger than every battle that we have faced in our lives, that our God rules, and that is a message that is worth sharing with the world, no matter how far we have to go to share that message with others. How beautiful are the feet that excitedly, passionately spread the word to the world that God has won. That everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, it does get back to feet in the end. How beautiful are the feet of the messenger. How beautiful are the feet of the one who is excitedly, passionately running to share that life-changing message with the world. A message that is shared with our words but requires action as well. The movement of feet as well. Shane Claiborne wrote a book a while back called The Irresistible Revolution, and Shane Claiborne had a chance in his life to go and live in Calcutta and to spend time with Mother Teresa before she passed away. And here's what he wrote about that experience. Mother Teresa was one of those people who sacrificed great privilege because she encountered such a great need. People often ask me what Mother Teresa was like. 
Sometimes it's like they wonder if she glowed in the dark or had a halo. I think I've wondered that myself. She was short, wrinkled, and precious, but maybe even a little ornery, like a beautiful, wise old granny. But there is one thing I will never forget, her feet. Her feet were deformed. Each morning in mass, I would stare at them. I wondered if she had contracted leprosy, but I wasn't going to ask, of course, hey, mother, what's going on with your feet? One day, a sister said to us, have you noticed her feet? We nodded, curious, and she said, her feet are deformed because we get just enough donated shoes for everyone. And mother doesn't want anyone to be stuck with the worst pair. So she digs through and she finds them. And years of doing this have deformed her feet. He wrote, years of loving her neighbor as herself deformed her feet. When she did pass, she was placed in a glass coffin for visitation, and those deformed feet were left exposed for everyone who traveled from all over the world to pay their respects to Mother Teresa to see a testimony of the life that she lived, a testimony of the ways that she was willing to love others at great cost and expense to herself. I'm sure she wanted a new pair of shoes. I'm sure that she could have written to anyone anywhere else in the world and said, hey, my feet are really starting to take a toll from this ministry thing that I'm doing every day of my life. I'm on them all the time. I'm caring for all these kids. I'm caring for this whole community. And anyone would have sent her the best, most orthopedic pair of sneakers that we could possibly buy and send them to her. Highly doubt that it's that she actually wanted the worst pair of shoes in the donated bin of shoes for herself. But the thing is that she wanted something else more. More than she wanted relief for her feet that were becoming def- more and more deformed and crippled by the day, and I'm sure painful. She wanted to make sure that no one else had a worse pair of shoes than she did a sign of the love and dedication that she had for the people in her midst. A pastor at Highland Park United Methodist Church spoke about Mother Teresa and her feet, and he talked about two different definitions of sacrifice, one an actual one and the other one that he made up to talk about her that I wanted to share because I felt like this was so incredibly valuable for us this morning. So he said, sacrifice is... Forfeiting something of value to attain something of greater value. In other words, sacrifice is giving up something that you want for something that you want more. I have made a sacrifice for this because I want this more, okay? But then he said, Mother Teresa is a great example of elevated sacrifice, which is forfeiting something of value to you to attain something of greater value for someone else. Forfeiting something that you want, something that is of value to you, for the sake of someone else having something greater, for the benefit of another. And the thing is that that calling toward elevated sacrifice isn't a calling that's just for Mother Teresa. It is a calling for every single one of us. When we say, Jesus, I want to follow you, I believe in you, I want to indeed be a part of the body of Christ, then we are saying, I want to be a messenger of this good news that I have experienced for myself. It is my job to share that message with others, to show the depth of your love for them as well. And in doing so, it is my job to put others in a place where I can actually show them that love. Sacrifice isn't about having everything that we want and then helping others and sharing that love with others. It's about forfeiting something that we really want for the sake of others as well. See this whole thing, and Mother Teresa isn't really about shoes at all. It's about not being afraid to take on the filth of the world, no matter what it costs us, in order to find ourselves in a restless pursuit of loving our neighbors as ourselves. It is wanting the absolute best possible for others and relentlessly doing all that we can 
to show it. So friends, I wonder for all of us today, what have we forfeited lately that we really wanted for the sake of someone else having a chance at something that we wanted for them more? As I was pulling the text together and what we're talking about today and and mission, here's what I came up with as our summary of all of this. We are called to be messengers with feet that very well may end up ugly in appearance because they are beautiful in practice. As followers of Jesus, as the body of Christ, we are called to live our lives in such a way that we care about sharing the love with others so much that in the end our feet may end up ugly in appearance, but beautiful in practice, beautiful in the way that they are being used, beautiful in the ministry that they are taking us to and the ways that they are sharing love with others. The opportunities to get involved in mission here are endless. That is part of the reason why we selected this ministry as our video today. Yes, we absolutely hope that you were inspired and you say, wow, I can drop off glasses, I can help organize, I can read numbers and try to match up, I can join up with the Kennedys and others to make a difference through this ministry. Yes, we hope that that is the outcome. And we hope that in highlighting something that you maybe haven't heard of before, you begin to see the amount of options of ways to get involved are endless because we all have different passions, we all have different gifts. And as the body of Christ, Being a part of mission is not something for a select few. It is something that we all say we will do this. In our membership vows, we say that we will support the church through our service. We will support the church through the ways that we are engaged in mission, and that is something that is required, that is called of, that is the responsibility of every single one of us. So how will we make a new commitment and missions this year. What will that look like for each and every one of us if we take that seriously to say, okay, God, I understand. I am called to be a messenger because this earth-shaking, life-changing news that everyone belongs in the body of Christ and everyone is loved incredibly in the body of Christ is worth sharing with the world, and I'm going to do my part to, yes, share it with my words, but in order to do so, We also know that our actions speak far more than our limited vocabulary can ever say, uh, can ever speak. And so how will we use all that we are and all that we have, our feet, our mouths, our ears, our hands, whatever it may be, to share the love of Christ with the world this year? As Wade begins to come up and and wrap us up, I want to leave us with one short story. So I was a 21-year-old college kid by the time I went on a mission trip. And that mission trip was with my college buddies, and we were going to Haiti. And as we get to Haiti, we have all of the energy and enthusiasm, and we're going to change the world mentality of a group of college students. I don't know anyone that can relate to that. So here we are, 21-year-old college students, and we're landing in Haiti, and we're like, yes, in the course of the week, I'm going to change the world. Everything is going to be different through us going to Haiti this week. Well, I cannot tell you how many of those experiences from that week still stay with me today, and I'm not going to lie, guide a lot of my conversations of what not to do in mission and what to avoid in finding a mission partner and all of those different things as well. They just came up the other week when we were in the Dominican Republic. But there's one thing about that week that stuck with me. There's one thing about that week that has continued to guide my life every single day to the best of my ability, to the grace of God, and it is being willing to say yes in any moment. Being willing to say yes to whatever crazy place of calling it might be. In the course of that week, we did all kinds of really mundane, monotonous things. One time we were like picking up boulders out of the driveway so that the cars could go down it a little easier. Another time we literally cleaned out the fridge But what I learned is that 
The lives of those kids in the orphanage were being changed every day by the missionaries and the people who were living with them. That wasn't my job. That was God's job and the work of those missionaries. My job was to say yes to whatever random small bit I could play in all of that. And that's a lesson we can take into our lives too, that we are never above picking up trash in a bathroom if we go into a bathroom and there's trash on the ground. We are never above any kind of small task, even if it's a smile at a waitress or a quick how are you to someone that is checking us out at the grocery store, whatever it might be, we have an opportunity every day of our lives to be those messengers with beautiful feet. The question is, will we allow God to use us to do just that? I believe that if we do, then the world will look drastically different as we come alive and embracing and understanding that Jesus' love is for every single one of us. Thank you, Amy. And she's exactly right. Every one of us is saying yes to something. We're saying yes to God, hopefully, but also we do spend a lot of time saying yes to ourselves and things that we want. And yet God is offering an invitation to be a part of a yes to the world around us. For friends, you are blessed to be a blessing. That's the equation. You have been blessed to be a blessing to those around you. Just as we've heard stories from Amy today and from Wendy before her in the video, God has uniquely equipped you to make a unique contribution to the world. I remember several years ago, I heard a pastor tell a story, and he, said, he compared two different scenarios. He said there, was a, uh, there were two uh, missionaries that had spent a few decades, from their 20s on into their 40s, uh, serving in uh, Africa, and uh, in small rural towns, all this stuff. Every day they had done that, very Mother Teresa-like. And then tragically, they were in a car accident, their lives seemed, they they ended seemingly prematurely. He set that story next to another story, a story of a couple that had lived, um, worked hard for 40 years, and they went into retirement. They bought a place on the beach, and their plan was to walk along the shores and collect seashells to add to their collection at the end of every day. And the pastor asked a question. He said, now which of these stories was a waste? We asked, was it a tragic waste for this group of missionaries to have their lives ended that way? Or is it a waste at the end of your life to show God your seashell collection and say, this was what I was living for? Now, surely they live for other things as well. My question is, what are we living for? Are we living for the blessings that we have? Or are we living for the purpose of receiving blessings to give and pay forward? Because church, I believe that this place, First Methodist, since I first got here, I have understood this place to be a blessing center. A place where we come to celebrate God's blessings and worship and then go out the doors and bless the world. We come here and we celebrate all that God has done, all that God has given to us. We go through our weeks experiencing the love and the favor and the blessing of God. But if all we do is hoard those blessings, then guess what? I found in my life that the blessing well tends to dry up at that point. Jesus tells a parable about it. He says to the servants, one, he gives ten talents, another five, another one talent, right? You've heard this story. And those that paid it forward, that invested and did something with it, they are given more. And the one that hoarded the talent for himself, even that one was taken away from them. Church, there's something in the heart of God that says, my heart is to give to you that you may pay it forward and give to others. And that is why our feet become beautiful. Because we bring good news. One final thought. I love what Amy said about how beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news. And it reminds me of all the times that I've received bad news. And do you know what they say? Anytime somebody brings bad news to you, you know what they say? Don't shoot the messenger, right? Because that's kind of what we want to do. But if somebody delivers me good news, 
Then it's like, oh man, I'm going to tip you? Uh, your feet look dirty, let me clean those feet for you? Like you must have come a long way to deliver this good news and I'm going to be a blessing to you in return. When we bless the world around us, delivering them good news, then my experience is they receive it with great joy. So the question today is, how are we saying yes to what God is calling us to do? Let's pray about it. God, you have blessed us richly. We have been given more than we could ever ask for or imagine, and we are grateful. We're grateful for the ways that you've shown up time and time and time again. We've, we're grateful for the ways you've shown up for our families, for our relationships, for our children, for our youth. We're so grateful for the ways that you have pulled us out of pit after pit, showing yourself to be faithful and true. And we, are, we celebrate and we worship you for that this morning. And yet we know you have delivered us to, to, to equip us to deliver others. You have given to us that we might give to others. This week, starting right now when we walk out of here, give us eyes to see where you are at work. Help us to hear your calling over our lives. And send us as light into darkness, as hope into hopelessness, as bringers of good news to those that need to hear it today. Use us for your kingdom and your purposes. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Church, would you stand as we sing together? Every 
every time I speak, I want to run to the ones in need. In the name of Jesus, I want to give my life away, all for your kingdom's sake. Shine a light in the darkest place. In the name of Jesus, I want to be your hands and I want to be your voice every time I speak. I want to run to the ones in need. In the name of Jesus, I want to give my life away. All for your kingdom's sake. Shine a light in the darkest place. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. just sang it, may we live that out in our lives. May we indeed allow ourselves to be sent into the world. Holy messengers with beautiful feet because of the way that they are being used. Helping everyone to know that they belong in the body of Christ and that they are loved. Go in peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs>